So uh, Riffs on Robot, which is not exclusively about robot anymore. Um, I'm just for the record, I'm putting up my sources here, which uh, might seem kind of retro, but um, just so that it's recorded for the uh, purposes of the, uh, I don't know, whatever kind of archive this is going to be. Um, so here's the list of words on your uh, program, on the back of your program. And robot is one of them, but you're going to see on the back of your program that there are lots of other words. I don't know if anybody here has looked at these words yet. Um, by the way, before I start, uh, could I just uh, ask, maybe since I can't see you very well because of the lighting, um, by sh sound, uh, how many people in this room are native speakers of English language? Native speakers. All right. Um, and um, uh, so how, uh, how many speakers of either Hebrew or Arabic, Semitic languages, native speakers? Hmm. Uh, how about other Indo-European languages, um, Italic languages such as French, Spanish, Portuguese, Romanian, any of, anybody? Uh, um, German, yeah. Germanic languages, okay, yay, okay. Um, and Slavic languages? Maciej, come on. I know there's at least two Poles in this room, so you guys fess up. <laughs> no, okay. Anyway, just wanted to get a sense of the audience for purposes of explaining things. Um, so I want to start, since we've been immersed in this incredible uh, series of sound worlds, uh, by rinsing our brains of the musical side of things. and. Now we're getting into visual and language-oriented uh, information coming at you. So I just want to take a moment to um, give you some images. I'm not going to say anything, really. I just want you to uh, look at these. And, and in whatever your native language is, or in English, if you prefer, uh, maybe you would come up. I'm going to give you a series of images. Maybe you have labels for whether you think this is you know, one thing or another. Or maybe if you're not the kind of person who likes to label things, you just have a, a response like, oh, that's cute, or that's kind of menacing, or hmm. Some of these pictures just have an object. Some of them have human beings with machine-like things. So just have a look at these. Maybe you have uh, a feeling one way or the other, or a word that comes to mind about what you would call these things. Um, if you're interested in the context, you can ask me later, because some of these have sort of interesting background stories. Um, yeah, as you know, just to get our minds oriented towards images uh, and the kind of knee-jerk and sometimes automated responses we have to images, sometimes they don't convey anything particular. They're just sort of, hmm, what is that? What is that? Uh, what, is, what is that? Um, uh, unfortunately, an all-too-familiar image right now. This is probably more mysterious. This is a, from this month on September 3rd. This is the um, uh, Native American peoples gathered in North Dakota to protest the um, bulldozing of their sacred land to build the Dakota Access Pipeline. I don't know if any of you have seen that in the news. So I'm going to jump in here for a second. First, I just want to say that um, uh, because of some issues that came up with the technology, I wasn't able to get access to some of the notes that I have for dates and some other d detailed information. So if at some point in this talk I say something like, in the late 19th century or in the late 15th century, as opposed to, um, in this case, uh, 1490, the date when Leonardo da Vinci uh, made the sketch, um, please forgive me, but I'm going to do my best to remember all the dates, and if I, if I fail, um, I hope you'll be forgiving. So this is a, a super famous image of Leonardo da Vinci's, and t at this point it's been reproduced so many times with so many variations that it's almost become kind of meaningless. It's even hard to look at it and actually see it anymore because it's been presented so many different ways and so many different times. But this is a, a, the, the so-called uh, drawing of Vesuvian Man, um, uh, named for uh, the, the uh, Roman architect and civil and military engineer Vesuvius in the first century uh, BC. 
um, who thought of this idea basically der derived from Pythagoras that the human body is um, the template uh, on which the architectural concepts of beautiful proportions is derived. So the human body becomes the, the male body, actually, in this case. Uh, Martin Burkhart, was anyone here last night for his talk? Okay, yeah, so he talked about this weird, weird tooth problem. Um, he also talked a lot about Pythagoras, so I chopped out a bunch of my uh, t notes about Pythagoras, but looming behind this image is Pythagoras. I mean, uh, there, there's this idea of proportion, there's this idea of beauty, um, there's also a concept of the human being at the, at, the, at the center of this as a sort of measure. And we probably all remember from you know, school books that when, when you learn about the Renaissance, this image is presented as like, oh, yay, you know, the birth of humanism, man is at the center of the universe now. And it's usually presented as an image that captures the idea that, okay, um, this is the, the, the Renaissance with a capital R. This is the, the, the birth of the, the humanistic moment in, in, human, in Western um, history. Actually, what I think is really interesting about it is that it's also the birth of looking at the human being. I mean, in some ways, you could see it as um, alternative story, as, as looking at the human being as a, as a mechanical object, uh, actually, is, is sort of what's happening here, an anatomical and mechanical object. And looming behind this Pythagorean idea of proportion and, and measure and, and beauty is also the idea of Pythagoras's that... Uh, space and, and speed of velocity of vibration, which is creating certain sounds, can be represented by numbers or by, math, by mathematics. Uh, uh, I hope we get to talk about that more with Gottfried afterwards because I know you have some very interesting um, points to make about that. But I think one, uh, just as, a, as an idea person, if you think, wow, you know, this is kind of a proto-Einsteinian moment. The, the, the morning the guy woke up and thought like, oh my God, space and time and vibrations of sound can be turned into numerical values and into mathematics. That must have been a pretty exciting, uh, real, it's kind of a proto-Einsteinian moment. It's sort of a, a, a version of the E equals MC squared, the idea that things can be turned into math problematic as that, as that can be from another perspective. But I just wanted you to take a look at this drawing of, of uh, the Vesuvian man of Leonardo da Vinci and see that, in a way, it's interesting that you can see um, the limbs as strings, in a way, with frets. You know, these are proportion lines that are drawn on the arms and legs. You can see almost fret lines, like, you know, making different sounds. It's almost as if the human body is being represented as, a, as an instrument. Here is, as many of you no doubt know all too well, um, the uh, drawings of, of da Vinci that were discovered in the 1950s to be actually um, uh, descriptions of a project to make a mechanical version of this Vesuvian man. This is five years later, 1495, and we have um, the, the rudiments here of a concept of a robotic-like creature um, and sometimes this Vesuvian, this, um, sorry, this uh, Da Vincian project is actually called the uh, Leonardo's Robot. It has been recreated um, as a mechanical knight here. It was shown in, this is a picture from a, a, an exhibition that traveled around. It was in Berlin in 2005 when, when this picture was taken. And you see there's like levers and pulleys that move this body around. So he used this drawing that we see all the time as an emblem of humanism to create a, a robot-like creature, although the word robot, as we will see, didn't emerge until f over 500 years later, so it's not really the right word to use because it carries a completely different set of connotations. So back to this word list. What I was going to do originally for this talk is just talk about the word robot and kind of focus intensely on it, but after thinking about uh, Gottfried's work, because he was going to be here, and also talking with the organizers of this festival who said, when I asked them, why did you choose Vicente uh, Robota as your title, why the robot? And they, the answer was, well, because it's just kind of, it could have been anything. I mean, it could be machines or androids or whatever, but, but robot is such a cool word. It's such a fun word. And I think that's a really interesting point. And I wanted to kind of look at that a little bit more carefully and also try to, first of all, just entertain you because I think it's really fun to look at word origins. I don't know if any of you are particularly interested in that. But I think for the artists in this audience, I hope to give you some information and, and ideas that would inspire your work and give you some uh, things to use and think about. And also, 
uh, to persuade you that it does make a difference which word you use um, if you're describing your, your instrument as a machine or a robot or an android or uh, any, I don't know, does anyone have other words that you use for your machines that you like? Um, we can talk about them later maybe. Um, it makes a difference. Uh, let me try to persuade you in a short uh, nutshell sort of way. Um, English as a language has, is a Germanic language and we have a lot of German-based words in our language, but actually the majority of our words come from Latin and French. So two-thirds of the English language now includes words from French and Latin. So if I'm applying for a grant because I want to get funding for my great new music project, I'm probably, if, I, if I'm going to team up with Gottfried, for example, I would probably want to use in my grant proposal in English the word collaborate. Why? because it's a Latin word, which is very sophisticated. It has lots of nice syllables. It sounds kind of powerful in English because it's collaboration. And it has a, a sense of seriousness because it comes into the language from Latin, which was very much a very organized and military language. If I use the English expression team up, which means pretty much exactly the same thing, it has a kind of casual and, you know, it's kind of, hyper enthusiastic, like team up. It even has a metrical quality to it. It has fewer syllables, it's more direct. Whereas in German, I'm told by some of my friends here who also apply for grants in German that, if they, that they actually like to avoid the word collaboration because it's been tainted by Nazi German. So they actually prefer to use team up because, or whatever they can to, to, uh, to talk about teaming and so on because it avoids this idea of collaboration. So words carry, I mean, that's just an example from more recent history, but words going back for thousands of years carry different semantic force fields within them. So when you use a word, you're deploying, um, knowingly or not, the history of how it's been used and what it can mean, both in the continuity of its own history and also what you're adding to it. So you can take a word and make it mean something new, but it's good to know where it came from, what the backstory is, so that when you use it, you know how much continuity you're involved with and how much discontinuity you're involved with. So I just wanna kind of ask you to fasten your robotic seatbelts and I'm gonna move really quickly through some of these words and then get to robot and, and dilate on that a little tiny bit and then we'll, we'll have a discussion after. So. My first word here is zombie, and of course this is the obligatory still from the film by George Romero uh, from 1968 at the height of the civil rights movements in the United States. We have a group of zombies, they're mainly white people moving across a field. This was actually shot, this film was shot uh, in a field and on location in a farmhouse in Pennsylvania. It's very important in the American context you think about this idea of agriculture and a field with people moving across it. This is at the apex, the dramatic apex of the film. Let's look a second at the word zombie. Um, just, I'll read this to you in case you can't read my handwriting. Uh, by the way, these are dictionary definitions. I, I took a few of the ones I wanted to look at. Uh, of course, there are more definitions of zombie. It's, a, it's also used to describe a cocktail. It's, you know, you can have a zombie computer that's taken over by an un unwanted user. But in this case, so, in voodoo belief, a corpse reanimated by supernatural power, or a snake god of voodoo cults in West Africa, Haiti, and the southern United States. So this is a word that comes into English from Louisiana French Creole, a specific dialect of French Creole in the southern part of the United States, and Haitian Creole, the word zonbi, of Bantu origin akin to Kimbundu's, that's a northern Bantu language, zombi, and that's a meaning uh, ghost, soul, or spirit. Um, so here, here's a picture by a Haitian artist named Hector Hippolyte, and uh, this title of this uh, painting of his is called The Zombies, and it shows oppressed slaves, uh, oppressed people's spirits being controlled by a colonial uh, power. And it's just to keep, to keep in mind when you use the word zombie in English, whether you uh, want to play on this or not, it comes attached to a history of slavery, it comes attached to a history of, uh, of um, African peoples being brought to the New World uh, for, for work, agricultural work and slavery, and it comes um, to some extent a tied, to, tied to issues of, of race. So it's not a, just a casual thing, and if you have a, a zombie uh, cocktail, you know, that's totally cool, but you can also just think about the fact that it comes from this particular background. Here is a picture of a bumblebee. Uh, for the word drone, a male bee that produces honey 
no honey, that's very important. Um, its only function is to mate with the queen bee. Another meaning is a person who does tedious or menial work. Another meaning is a remotely controlled or autonomous aircraft with no pilot on board. Um, so this is an interesting word. Uh, it's a word that comes into English not from Africa or from some other place, but it comes just from English. It was passed down from Middle English, a medieval language spoken and sometimes written, but not very often, between um, uh, 1150 and roughly 1500. And it also has its roots back in Old English, and many other Germanic languages have uh, words that have uh, similar sounds uh, that have to do with dran in Old English, dronen, for example, in German. So um, it, just a note here that in the 1930s, there was this US naval jargon uh, developed where they called these uh, you know, pilot-free aircraft drones because the idea that was that the, that the ship or wherever the, the ground zero was of the military operation controlling these drones would be like the queen bee, and these drones would be sent out to do labor and then come back. So that's how drone got to be you know, used as a word for military drones. Um, particularly American ones that are controlled out of the Ramstein Air Base here in Germany. I um, hope you guys managed to get rid of that. Um, so moving along now to, um, this is a botanical image of a tree. I wanted you to focus on the twig. I, I, I don't know if you can see that, um, that on the left-hand side up at the top, on the, there's a little twig thing. It's not a very commonly used word, so I don't know if everybody knows it. On the upper right-hand side, there's a close-up of a twig. and. This is actually the origin of the word um, for clone. It's just Greek for uh, clone in ancient Greek just means twig. Um, this was a word that was introduced into English by botanists, who academics who took this word from Greek and used it to describe a botanical. It was initially just used for you know botanical life, and then it it crossed over into mainstream use to describe things like. Um, uh, a group of cells or organisms that are, uh, well, actually, that's a botanical description, so that doesn't count, but um, just uh, one that copies or closely resembles another, like, you know, clone of, uh, it's pretty randomly used these days, but with this idea of copying. I just took this image from the remake of Battlestar Galactica, the TV show, um, showing the character number eight, uh, who's multiple clones, and that's, like, super scary in this particular TV show. Um, here is a, uh, here's the golem. This is a reproduction of the golem of Prague. Um, I wanted you to focus on the little dot on his forehead for a second. Um, another image of the golem by a particular artist who's mentioned in my um, sources. Uh, he has written on his head in Hebrew uh, the word emet, uh, which reads, of course, in Hebrew, it's right to left, so emet. And when the rabbi, in some versions of this story, because there's multiple versions, when the rabbi who made this golem uh, discovered that he was running out of control and was going completely crazy, the way he deactivates the golem is by taking off the first letter. It's sort of like a code, like a programmed code. Taking off the first letter of emet in Hebrew gives you met. So emet means truth, and met means dead. So the golem stops functioning and you know, bec becomes less out of control. Uh, there's a bit of the golem story haunting the story of the robot because theoretically you know, robots are there to serve and help the community and so on, but then if they don't get programmed right or something goes wrong, there are potential uh, run amok scenarios right and left. So the origin of golem in Jewish folklore and artificially created humans su supernaturally endowed with life is just that it's from Hebrews golem, meaning a lump, a clod, formless mass, an unfinished thing. It's from golem to wrap up, uh, and it has the Semitic root of gim, to cut, break off, or separate. So it's this sort of Frankenstein idea of like taking parts of something and creating an, a, a, something out of that. I just thought it was interesting because I'm a Battlestar Galactica fan, as you may now determine, um, to put up this Battlestar Galactica centurion who's supposed to be a robot, but I think he has a kind of, um, uh, I think he's descended partly from the golem because of this dot on his head, which is the remnant of this emet met code problem. So uh, if you want to put a dot on your instrument, on the forehead of your instrument, it would probably in some deep way signify that you're connecting your instrument to some golem-like creature that may actually go out of control. Um, robots on their own can do that too, of course. But anyway, so here we've got um, four words that we've seen so far. Clone, drone, 
golem and zombie. Uh, zombie coming from Africa, golem from Hebrew, drone coming from English. By the way, most people who study this believe that the drone word in English uh, Germanic languages comes from on a monopoetic uh, features of the b bumblebee. So drone is actually the sound of a of a bee, and the musical concept of a musical drone is is coming from the same root. Um, clone from Greek, and these four remaining words that I want to look at are automaton, uh, cyborg, machine, and then ultimately robot. So these are different from the one. I mean, well, these are these are a little bit. Different. Let me just show you something about these. These four words we're going to look at come into English from other, uh, like clone, from other languages in the same family of languages, which is the Indo-European family of languages. Um, and just to give you an idea, it's the largest family of languages in the known uh, history of the world. Um, it, it's incredible. This is a chart made by Calvert Watkins, which features in the appendix of the online dictionary that I cite in my, in my sources. Um, I don't know if you can see it on this uh, slide, but the Indo-European family of languages goes all the way from Ireland, Celtic languages, to uh, West, Af West uh, China, where the Tocharian languages were once spoken, but they're now extinct. So you can see on this chart that the, the fan parts that go out all the way to the end are languages that are still spoken today, and the ones that are sort of shorter are the ones that are dead, essentially, like Hittite, which is an Indo-European language, or Tocharian languages, of which there are two versions. Um, English is, of course, in this Germanic language fan, which is the, uh, can you guys see where it is? It's in the middle of the second one on the, on the left, and it shows you how English evolved out of Middle English, Old English, some Germanic language, and then uh, another level, and then you get back to this thing in the middle called PIE, and what that just means is, or it says Proto-Indo-European, and what that is is a reconstructed language which linguists have remade based on the roots of these shared languages. In other words, what we're saying here, which is kind of hard to come to terms with easily, is that all of these languages are descended from one, one community of speakers, more or less. So uh, that speaker community was from 7,000 years ago. We don't... Um, What's fascinating, I, I wish I could tell you more about this, but we don't have time, is that um, if you uh, take these roots that you can reconstruct from the existing uh, records of these languages and the living languages, you can find roots which uh, tell you about what those people in that community were actually speaking about. So, if, for example, in German you have the word Tour for door, and in English we have door, and in uh, Persian you have dar, and in Sanskrit you have duru, and you take the roots and you reconstruct what was going on in this original uh, speech community that was, had these things in common with these languages, you discovered that these people had doors. In fact, we, we learn a lot about this community. They, they are agricultural people. They lived with salmon. They lived in snow. They had birch trees. We, we know quite a bit by reconstructing these roots. Um, why is this interesting? It doesn't mean that when you use a word like robot, you have to be, and you're going to see what the root is in a, in a minute. I think you'll be kind of surprised because it's very cool. I, I, I was really excited when I did the research for this talk. Um, it doesn't mean that when you use a word, you have to respect its ancient or prehistoric roots. Uh, the whole point is that these words evolve in meaning, and they, they evolve to suit the realities of our times. As we evolve, we, we change the meaning of words. But it's really interesting to see the course of these words and to understand that when you're using them, you're getting access to the entire course of the evolution of that concept. Um, so let me just start with machine. I picked this picture to represent machine. It's a Smith Premier typewriter built in 1887 in Syracuse, New York. I like the idea of a typewriter as a machine for artists because it's the idea of you know, writing. Uh, I, I'm a writer. I, I like the idea that I use a machine to uh, now maybe more a computer, but uh, something that was used to, to write. It, but it was also manufactured in a gun factory, which kind of captures the problem of machines. There's a, there's a sort of light and dark side to it. This was a, originally made in a, in a, in a um, factory which was also devoted to weapons. Um, let's look at the origin of, of the word machine and the root of it, a device consisting of fixed and moving parts that modifies mechanical energy and transmits it to a more useful form. It comes from French into English, from Old French into French, and then f from there it, it got the uh, word from Latin's machina. And from uh, the, the way Latin got it, this is just in parentheses, in these brackets, you see the path that it went to get into English. Uh, it, it came from a Greek dialect, 
where the word that got into Latin was uh, machana, and that was a, a variation of mechane, which you hear in the word mechanic or mechanical. Um, the root of this word is to be able to have power. It is the same root that in German is used for the word macht. It is the idea of power, which can be good, but it's also dangerous. Um, the, the words that we have in English that come from this root include, I just put a few to give you a sense, may, dismay, might, which is also a form of power. It's related to the word macht, main, machine, of course, is in there, mechanic, but also the word magic, which I think is kind of cool, the idea that machines also have a, a relationship to magic, which comes from Persian, and magus, also from Persian, that it comes into English. And just put in this picture of Martin uh, Molin's uh, marble machine that he built, which wor works manually. I was <laughs> shocked to see when I accessed this, it had 25 million hits on it, YouTube. Um, but it works manually as well as powered by 2,000 marbles. Uh, picture of Robocop, part man, part, what does it say? Machine, all cop. Um, this is an early idea, uh, this is one idea of a cyborg. And now let's just look at cyborg for a second. Um, I'm trying to read my uh, slide here. Um, uh, can you guys see what it says? Um, a, uh, uh, an organism, often a human, with uh, uh, certain physiological processes enhanced or controlled by mechanical or electronic devices, uh, especially when they're integrated into the nervous system. Uh, it comes from, the first part of the word comes from cybernetics, cybernetic, and the last part, org, comes from organism. So cybernetics comes from Greek, kubernetes, meaning governor, from the verb kubernan, to govern in ancient Greek, uh, rule, uh, control, and uh, organ, a really interesting word that we can talk about later, with Gottfried, um, again, he has incredible ideas about this word that um, I think are very exciting. Comes in from Middle English, uh, from Old French and Old English at the same time, organ, from Latin organon, and then back uh, from the Greek, um, uh, from Latin organum and from Greek organon. So the root for this is to do, work. That's the root of organ, both the musical instrument and the organs in your body. Um, the words we have in English that come from the same root are work, energy, surgery, uh, synergism, organ, and even orgy. Um, these come in from different directions into English, but the point is that they all have been descended from the same root in Proto-Indo-European. Um, whether the future cyborgs will include any flesh or wet brains, uh, if we're up to date on what's going on in the artificial intelligence world, is to be questioned because it's um, been pointed out that there's no way that a wet brain or wet nervous system, a human flesh and central nervous system could possibly function in you know, outer space. So it would likely be completely mechanical or you would have maybe an upload, you would take the human being's memories and your, all your compositions that you've made and all of your favorite ideas and turn it into a, um, a kind of programmable you that would be put into a, a, a cyborg, but it, whether that would be, probably it would still keep the word cyborg. We can wait and see if we live that long. Um, here is a picture which I don't know if many of you know of uh, the, the, the incredible work of Al-Jazari, the, uh, the inventor and engineer, um, visionary who was born in what is today Iraq, but served in an Anatolian uh, Turkish court in the early 13th century. This is a work that was completed from, this is a page from a, a Syrian manuscript actually, of a work that Al-Jazari completed in 1209. Um, he made a huge contribution to um, mechanical uh, devices. These are robotic, essentially, uh, these are automata of sorts, uh, a, a band of musicians floating on water that is hydro-powered, so the musicians are playing in a boat, um, um, presumably to uh, you know, entertain the court, with this camshaft, and he's famous for developing the camshaft and all sorts of, we've seen some amazing uses of camshaft <laughs> in this festival, but here's an, uh, an early Al Jazari contribution to that um, technology. Another automaton that we've seen already. Oh, so what about automaton? A self-operating machine or mechanism from Latin, self-operating machine, from Greek, 
automatos, auto coming from just the idea of auto, like auto self, and matos meaning willing. The pi root for this, the Proto-Indo-European -Indo root for matos is men, meaning to think. And this is a really fascinating root because it also gives you words like music. Um, who would have thought that the root for to think in, in Proto-Indo-European, a language sp spoken 7,000 years ago, would result in the concept of music? Um, so we see all these different words that have come into English from this root, and I thought I would just break it down for a second to show you that men, to think, the first word that I put on that list, mind, comes from English, that's a native word. Minnesinger is incorporated into English from uh, Old High German, where minne means love and singer means singer. So minnesinger, these are, you know, German troubadours, essentially. Monitor, oops, what did I just do? Monitor, monster, and monument all come from uh, Latin automatic, mania, and music come from Greek, and mantra uh, doesn't really enter English. I mean, academics knew about it in the 19th century and a little bit before, but it really comes in with the Beatles and Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in the 60s um, when people you know, started being interested in mantras. But it comes from Sanskrit, of course. Um, and I just wanted, because we had this incredible flute uh, machine last night, it played a beautiful piece, I wanted to include Al Jazari's perpetual flute design where hydro-powered uh, flute playing goes on as long as you have the hydro, the water power to keep it sustained. This is again from uh, very early uh, 13th century, 1209 is when he drew that, but presumably built it before that. So now to the um, festival's main subject, the robot. Um, let me just give you the dictionary thing here about robot. Um, again, picking one of the main definitions, a mechanical device that sometimes uh, resembles a human and can perform comp complex tasks and commands by being programmed in advance, on command or by being programmed in advance, or a machine or device that operates automatically or by remote control. Um, comes in from Czech, the language Czech, from rabota, drudgery, meaning really hard, dull, tedious, laborious work, um, which itself is a word that comes in from Old Church Slavonic, rabota, uh, meaning servitude. And the, the earlier version, rabu, is, means slave. So we're back to zombie land a little bit here, the idea of being enslaved and being forced to do work that you don't necessarily want to do. Um, the the Proto-Indo-European root for this word means to turn. It's like, what is that? Why to turn? This is really fascinating. So the words that come into English can tell us a little bit about why it is to turn, that robot has this relationship to turning. Uh, um, during the last piece that we heard by uh, the Gamut uh, group, we had this rotating, uh, you know, um, uh, dark disco ball, and um, I was thinking about the connection with that. Um, you have the obvious one here in the second group of words descended from this root in English, orb and orbit. Orb meaning a disc or a sphere from Latin orbus, and orbit coming from orbita meaning a rut, or like when you get your wheels stuck in mud, it leaves a track. Um, that Latin word orbita meaning you know track in the mud basically uh, becomes the word in English orbit, the thing that goes around. It's a track of some kind. That seems obvious because those are things that turn. A disc or a wheel or some object like this orb-like object, it turns. But what about Gastarbeiter, which comes into English as a borrowed word from German? By the way, Arbeit in German comes from the same orb. It's the same root. Um, well, it turns out that the worker, the Arbeiter, uh, the Gastarbeiter here in English, um, is uh, so this, uh, the reason you get Arbeit um, involved with uh, turning is that the, the original work of proto indo peoples was working in fields, going back and forth with their, you know, making their rows in the field. And this idea of turning back and forth, and this just endless turning was part of the story of work and laborious, awful work. Um, orphan, why would orphan be in there? It's from the Greek word orphanos, just meaning bereft of a father. It turns out that turning in the Proto-Indo-European community was also associated with this idea of, um, of turning your circumstances around. So you lost some prestige or you lost something important to you like your father. So the orphan is, is a, re a related word. And then there's robot, which we saw comes from the Czech idea of drudgery, hard labor, kind of like Arbeit, same root. 
and uh, ultimately from, from slavery. So I'm gonna leave the third one out for a second because that's gonna be my grand finale in a few seconds, but let me just start with robot. Um, the word robot comes packaged with this idea of human beings resembling machines. This is a still photograph from the film by George Lucas, uh, THX 1138, the name of the sound system you may have seen in the cinemas. Um, when the picture goes on, it's like THX 1138. Um, comes from this film that he made before he did Star Wars, uh, made in 1971, but this still actually comes from the director's cut from 2004, so you didn't see this picture in the original film. But somewhere in this lineup, it looks like a bunch of robots are building something. It's actually, a, these are human beings. Because of their work in a factory, they become more and more like robots. They sort of merge with the things they're actually building. It, it, by virtue of working on them so much, they become like robots. So THX is actually in there somewhere. Here's, again, a picture of THX with his uh, 1138 with his partner, LUH um, 3417. Um, they're trying to get out of the darkness and into the light. They're trying to get free. They're basically enslaved and oppressed in this horrible dystopian nightmare. And these are these robot-like chrome policemen who are stopping them. I just want to vaccinate you for what's to come at the end in a second here by asking you to consider, for example, that <clears throat> there's something uh, Orphic, uh, Orpheus-like about this. Look at how he, he's trying to lead his you know, sort of Eurydice figure out of hell, bring her into the light from this uh, horrible world where people are being turned into uh, drugged, oppressed m machines, and he's being stopped by these two menacing figures with one holding the staff. So just keep that in, uh, image in your mind for a second. Here's a picture of Karl Chapek. He's a Czech, uh, he was a Czech playwright who wrote a play in which the word robot first appeared. It's really interesting when a, when a word first enters the language, uh, any language, the thumbprint of that first moment when it enters is, is sort of left in the word, and so it's very hard to, uh, it takes a while for the word to evolve. So we've been sort of left with this thumbprint moment where he was the first to put this word robot in his play, which was, um, not actually his idea. It turns out that Karl Chapek had a brother, uh, Josef Chapek, who was a painter, and while Karl was working on the play, he said, you know, I'm writing this play about these, these synthetic creatures who are sort of creatures made by synthetic flesh and blood, and this guy is gonna make a lot of them, and they're gonna help human beings, and at the end, they're gonna take over the world and kill everybody, except for one person. Um, and I, I was thinking of the word like labori, like from Latin, laborers, and he said, but I just don't like this word, what do you think? And his brother, Yusuf, the painter, said, and presumably the story is that, the, that Carl asked him while he was in the act of painting. And, uh, uh, and Yusuf said, how about rob roboti? Which wasn't a word in Czech. It was coming from an existing word, rabota, meaning drudgery and compulsive, compulsory labor, but it didn't exist. And here is a painting of, uh, by, uh, Yusef Chapek, a self-portrait of his, a cubist painting, which was part of the reason he got in trouble with the, um, yeah, <laughs> great painting. And I, this is a painting actually dated 1920, the same year as the play, and I like to think in my fantasy life that he was actually painting this painting, when, uh, which looks kind of robotic too, when um, Carl asked him, like, do you have an idea for a word? And then he, he went, yeah, how about this? And anyway, but it's, it's possible that he was painting something else. Why was this such a great word to pick? Oh my God. Um, first of all, because at this time in 1920, it was just after World War I, when all of these, uh, th th this huge rise in mass production, factories and making things in factories was really dehumanizing people. And here you have a picture from 1917 of a factory making weapons. Uh, this is in Toronto in Canada. They're making shells to sell to the United Kingdom, to Great Britain. Uh, to use in World War I, and you see the bosses in the back are sort of standing up, and you see the workers are sort of at the same level as the, as the weapons, and they're, they're working in there. And this sort of, it, this image kind of creates this idea of all of these um, factories that mass produce things are, are in a sense war factories. People who work in factories are part of a war process, whether it's literal or class warfare or whatever. The other great thing about the word is it had to do with agriculture in the Czech language. It had to do with this idea that we talked about. Um, this is a painting from, uh, this is a Polish painter, uh, Józef uh, 
Chelmonsky, um, I forget the date, uh, late 19th century, um, and it, it's showing just this really hard work. So this word ro uh, robot contains both this idea coming from sort of factory work and the modern era in mass production and also this very ancient idea of just turning and turning and working really hard agriculturally. Uh, and the serfdom story, of course, in Eastern Europe is also behind this. So this play was hugely popular. Here's a poster from an American production. Um, uh, here's a picture from an early production of the play where you see the robots are costumed in a certain way and you see the human beings kind of freaking out about them. And I just, uh, I should also add that the, the word robot comes into German in 1923. The, the translation of uh, the play was 1923. In America it was 1923, but the play got done in New York a, a year earlier before the play was even published. It, it, everyone was so excited that they did a production a year ahead. So it was quite early in the United States. Um, I just wanted to mention in passing that both Karl and Josef uh, Chapek had moments in Berlin. Uh, Karl studied at Humboldt University in 1910. Uh, he studied um, uh, philosophy. And, um, and Josef was uh, unfortunately, well, Car Karl died in Prague um, pretty much around the moment when uh, the Germans came in and uh, was it 1938? And, and Yosef was unfortunately taken into various different camps and uh, spent some time at Sachsenhausen here just north of Berlin. So I just wanted to mention, again, the light and dark side of the word robot is also kind of captured in their own history in Berlin. Isaac Asimov, of course, uh, in, in 1950, this is the, the first edition cover of his book, I, Robot, containing his short stories. In the atomic age, when we had nuclear weapons, the idea that human beings could actually destroy the whole world and themselves uh, really fused with the concept of the robots. It wasn't just a scary sort of factory idea anymore. It was just like, oh my God, the whole planet could, could uh, explode. So there's this also a very sort of menacing side to the robot that continued through the 1940s. And then after the war, we get to the 1960s. We did have actual robots, uh, industrial and commercial robots in the 1960s, not that many. In the popular imagination, for most people in the world, as far as I know, uh, the robot was still this kind of slightly fantasy thing. It was sort of still linked to the idea of a creative. This is a still from a show on United States television right during the height, um, again, of the, of the um, rights era, but also the Cold War when everyone was really nervous about uh, atomic issues and nuclear warfare. And here is a family of, col of space colonists. It's called Lost in Space, and it's basically a family. And they, member, the member of their family that's not human is this, is this robot. And at that time, just to show you how far we've come, this character's name was just Robot. And that was really exciting in mid-1960s, like, oh, wow, Robot. Um, today, that would be unthinkable. You can't ha have a character named Robot. It would just be so boring. But at the time, that was kind of actually pretty sexy. Um, one huge uh, leap for the word robot and its prestige was that in 1979, uh, Carnegie Mellon founded the Robotics Institute, where the incredibly the uh, academic people decided to take the word robot. I mean, they could have called it, you know, the Machine Institute or Future of Machines or something like that, but they decided to call it the Robotics Institute, which really changed the um, the 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 academic traction, if you like, of the word robot. So, what about this third and final thing? And now we're to wrap up. This concept of turning, um, orb, uh, the third, uh, the third uh, concept that comes out of this in, in our language is Orpheus. Why would Orpheus be related to turning and to robots or to anything to do with uh, this kind of work? It's because possibly, it's not certain, but that he's the one who goes over to the other side. He goes into Hades and, and comes back. He's the one who turns. So just to take a brief look, and this is a little bit speculative, so just um, to bear with me for a second. Here's a, a Sicilian mosaic from the Roman era showing Orpheus with a Kellis uh, version of the Orphic lyre uh, made from, the, from a tortoise shell, from the back of a tortoise shell. And you can see that all the animals are listening to his beautiful music. And I think it's really interesting that in the bottom right-hand corner of this image, you see a living tortoise is also listening, <laughs> presumably waiting to be turned into an instrument. Um, this is a painting by uh, Sir uh, Edward uh, Pointer from uh, 1862. Um, it shows Orpheus leading Eurydice out of 
uh, out of Hades. And I, I, I wanted to include this because it's after the advent of, this painting was made after the Industrial Rev Revolution, but before the word robot emerged. So just to have a, a quick look at this, um, notice uh, how Orpheus's head and the lyre are kind of integrated into one another, as if they were one object, one integral object. And also notice how his cape going behind him forms a kind of uh, force field of um, connectivity around the instrument. So the bottom of the instrument is dark and it's sort of the same color as a cape and it creates this idea that his whole body almost is fused with this instrument. It's very beautiful as an idea. It's also kind of sexy because it's, the body is, the, the lyre is extending out of his inguinal um, you know, pelvic area. So there's this kind of sexual energy coming out of that. And you also, I think, well, Freud would have been happy to see this menacing two snakes down at the bottom on their trail, also part of this, um, the danger of making this turn out of hell and back into the world. And also just remember that picture we saw of THX 1138 with him taking his, trying to take his partner into the light and these two cops, these two robot cops. I mean, in a way, um, there's a kind of link with, with this image. Um, just for a second, this, looking back at the Greek, the, you see also here the face, the head of the singer is positioned over the instrument that there's this kind of merging. This is a kitara, a very beautiful, uh, technologically pretty complex instrument from 5th century. This is an attic uh, representation, very lovingly represented. The instrument is almost more interesting than the singer. Um, but uh, I, it's also interesting that, that kitara is the origin of the word uh, guitar. It's the same, this is, this is a seven string. Uh, instrument, um, but I, I just wanted you to look at this idea of this integration, this uh, this co-integration of the singer and the instrument. And now a, a painting by John William Waterhouse from 1905, showing the moment where after Orpheus fails to bring Eurydice back into the light, he is ripped apart uh, into sh sort of ripped to shreds in some versions of the story, and his head and the lyre float down a river, wash into the Mediterranean, and end up on the shores of Lesbos in, in Greece still singing and still playing music in spite of the fact that they're dismembered and here are being noticed by these two beautiful nymphs. Notice how the head and the lyre remain attached. The human and the technological object are kind of fused and uh, this watery environment, just look at that for a second. Here's some other similar representation, I mean, I mean, these are period representations. This, this is Gustave Moreau's painting from 1865. Again, the lyre and the head kind of fused. Um, the Belgian painter uh, Jean Delville's um, 1893 painting um, with, has this kind of stars in the water and it's much more kind of uh, surreal, mystical representation. But to go back to Waterhouse, um, this is a study of this picture. I just want you to look for a second this idea of the human, the technological, and the environmental. The instrument, the human body, and the environment in this watery, fusional moment, undifferentiated. Uh, and to close this talk and to open up a discussion, I wanted to end with this extraordinary photograph by an American uh, artist, David Benjamin Sherry. The paint, this uh, photograph is called Self-Portrait as a Born Feeling. Not Jason born, but like birth born. It's from 2009. He uses these monochromatic sort of scapes. He's put himself in this in, I mean, this is kind of an Orphic-like moment. He, he, he's created an image of himself emerging from this quagmire of green. It's, it's kind of um, positioned between being uncertain whether this is good or bad. There's wonderment, but there's also menace. Um, there's also this spot of yellow in the flowers that's radiating outward and maybe creating a sort of uh, a sphere of light and hope. Maybe this is this another Orphic element. Um, I thought it would be nice to end here because I think it's an interesting image for showing where we are uh, in this uh, moment where we have a very undifferentiated relationship between human beings, instruments, and the environment. We're increasingly seeing ourselves, this is all one. This is this all interconnected. Where, do you, where does the self stop and the world outside the self begin? Where does the instrument stop and the human being begin? So uh, with this idea of nature and the synthetic 
kind of fused in this uh, nature portrait that he took of himself, I'd like to close and say that I'm really looking forward to discussing things with Gottfried and maybe having people ask him questions about his work and um, having an opportunity to just think about, uh, yeah, the word robot and other words, what, what would you choose for, for your instrument? Thank you.